so today we're going to look more at um, alkanes and specifically we're going to start looking at the 3D structure of alkanes um, and what are called conformers. I mean, a conformer is kind of like an isomer. So then a conformer usually means it's the same molecule, but arranged differently in space. And so the um, and so they can be a little bit tricky, but it, it it's worth spending time on because there are a couple of cases where um, the the rate that you find an alkane in a different conformer determines how reactive it is, for instance. Um, and whether or not you put a, a specific substituent in position A or position B is determined by what kind of conformers it makes. B plus, it just gets us thinking um, in terms of what we call sterics. Um, sterics just means basically that things take up space and push away other things. So specifically, when we're talking about electron clouds, electrons always push away other electrons, right? It's the same logic as Vesper geometries. And we, we went back and looked at hybridized orbitals, and we figured out that all the Vesper geometries show up from just hybridizing these orbitals properly. Um, but the easiest way to think about it is electron clouds push away other electron clouds, right? And since every atom in an organic molecule has electrons around it, everything is electron clouds. So the nuclei, we think about the nuclei is pushing on the other nuclei, but it's really the clouds of electrons around the nuclei pushing away the other electron clouds. Fun, fun brain teaser to think about. When you push something, when you touch something, you're not actually touching the matter. The matter of your fingers is not touching the matter of the desk. Your, the electron clouds in your fingers are pushing against the electron clouds in the object. And those are pushing each other or repelling each other, but there's no, at the, that's what we consider physically touching something, but it's not actually like the matter comes into contact with the other matter at the, at the quantum level. Um, it's another one of those things where it's, you know, depending, you have to define your frame of reference properly because, you know, if we're just talking at the macroscopic level, nobody cares that it's electron clouds pushing electron clouds, right? Even if you talk about though, it's still, even there's in the atomic space, space, there's still space. Yeah, yeah because, because remember that, you know, um, for a carbon atom, a baseball and at, at the pitcher's mound of uh, Oracle Park is the size of the nucleus, as the volume of the nucleus, and the volume of the electrons is the rest of the stadium. So there's so, so the nuclei are so small, everything is electron clouds, basically. Um, and so those electron clouds pushing on other electron clouds is what we call sterics. Um, and it's a simple enough word. It seems like I should know the root for that since I know the root for a lot of other, other words, but I don't know where that comes from, where that term is derived. Um, I'll just say a, a chemistry meme that showed up for one of my feeds. We've seen this is this one that was the one on Jeff Goldblum. Um, the Ragnarok, maybe? Yeah, it was Ragnarok. Um, turns out the Marvel movies are like a, a treasure trove of science memes. If you know where to look and how to apply them. I like this one. It's not a real circle, but like a freaky circle. <laughs> All right, a few more things about properties of alkanes. This is kind of going to illustrate why we're going to spend time, so much time looking at the different stereoisomers. Um, so this is <clears throat> um, just the, the what we call the enthalpy of combustion. So enthalpy of combustion is exactly what it sounds like, just like you can have Ka is a standard weak acid reaction. Um, for most organic compounds are going to have, are going to be able to burn in oxygen. And they're all going to wind up as CO2 and water, right? So it's a good standard for determining how much energy is in the various chemical bonds. If you're going to take everything and turn it to CO2 and water, as long as you normalize based on the stoichiometry, this gives us a way to estimate how much energy is in the chemical bonds that was then that were then broken. Right. And so if all of the bonds are the same energy, then our our molecular formula should determine our delta H, right? These have the same molecular formula, 
eight carbons and 18 hydrogens. But when you burn them, you get slightly different. They're pretty close delta H values, but they're not identical. So what's different about those two isomers? They have the same number of hydrogens, right? And the hydrogens can't be bound to other hydrogens. So that means that it's the same number of carbon hydrogen bonds. Does it have the same number of carbon carbon bonds? Let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven carbon carbon bonds. One, two, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So same number of carbon hydrogen bonds, same number of carbon carbon bonds, and yet not the same enthalpy of combustion. Is it because of the Wieserski structure? It turns out that while all carbon carbon sigma bonds are going to be relatively close to the same energy, the fact that we have all of them closer together here means that they're steric forces. It means that those electron clouds are pushing on each other, and that makes it a little bit less stable. So you get less energy out of it when it burns compared to when it's a straight chain, there's a lot less interactions between the different carbons, right? Hydrogens are tiny. They still have electrons around them, but they don't take up much space physically, right? So this is about as, as extended as it could be, as far apart as you could have the carbons. Forcing the carbons closer together by making them all put in those methyl groups here means that you've got carbons pushing on other carbons. And that's what it's going to account for, the difference in the enthalpy of combustion. And again, it's not much. It's, what is that, 18 kilojoules per mole out of 5,000? It's a small amount, but it's measurable. And we're in the type of class now where when we find a small discrepancy, we try to explain it, not as opposed to just saying it's close enough. Carbon-carbon bonds are about the same energy no matter what. That's gen chem thinking. We're moving past that now. Uh, here's just a, a graphical way of representing the same thing. So this, and this one also takes... Um, if you added the two methyl groups versus adding four methyl groups, right? And so you get a 10 kilojoule per difference if you just take two of the carbons and make them methyl groups. And then if you go further and make it a tetramethyl butane, you get a, another eight kilojoules per mole difference. And so there was, what we can come up with as a conclusion is these that methyl groups and crowding things together is going to affect how stable they are. What would this look like as far as the aromatic? As far as what? The aromatic cyclo means octane. Um, so when we get to cyclo groups, cyclo groups have their own type of, of steric interactions. Um, there's a Turns out steric interactions have sort of two categories. There's either um, either they're pushing on each other and trying to get away from each other because they're physically taking up space, um, or there's strain energy where you force something to be at a different angle than it wants to be. So tetrahedral carbons are supposed to be 109 degrees, right? Um, and so actually we use water and meth methane as an, as an example. So methane, everything's symmetrical, tetrahedral, everything's 109.5 degrees roughly, right? Seems familiar, right? Water has the two lone pairs that are one sticking out of the board, one's going into the board. But the bond angle between the two hydrogens is no longer 109.5 degrees. Because these take up more space, they force this bond closer together. 
I want to say that's about 105 degrees now. Good. And so the fact that you're forcing these two bonds closer together than they would be in an ideal situation means means that there's extra, that's what strain energy is. So you can think of it kind of like you're loading a spring a little bit. These things are still pushing back against it, but because there's extra force from the lone pairs, they're being pushed closer together. Right? And that turned out that that's, that winds up being the biggest part of the steric, sterics is basically tweaking the geometry so they're not, not 109.5 anymore, or they're not 120 degrees anymore. And it all is going to come down to what's the biggest object in taking up space, because that's going to kind of squeeze everything else together. So you can think of like a three D model with magnets. Yeah, it's and electrons are magnets, right? Yeah, push each other. Hard to squeeze. It's electromagnetic force, but that's exactly what it is. These things are are pushing with magnetic force. They're not physically touching it, but they're creating a magnetic field that pushes these ones closer together. And right, so what we're going to go through today is we're going to, I'm going to give you some tools to be able to sort of qualitatively look at this. Um, but first, just some more, um, another property of volcanoes thing. I keep talking about how it, like hexanes are just stuff that, that condense at different at the same temperature and same for gasoline. Um, turns out that as, as grossly polluting as they are, um, they're just a modern marvel in terms of chemical, from the chemical engineering standpoint. Petroleum refineries are hugely complex and to the point where like, you can make your career as a petroleum engineer if you find a way to eke out an extra half a percent of efficiency out of a, a specific process. Um, and they're run continuously, which is really weird to think about with the distillation, right? We've done a little bit of, um, as we haven't done a whole lot in this class with distillation yet, but the concept is basically heat a mixture of two things up, right? And whatever comes out the other end when it recondenses is going to be slightly more pure in whatever condenses it, or whatever um, boils at the lower temperature. Um, that's what's referred to as batch distillation, where you take a, a thing, you cook it up, you boil it, you collect what's going on at the other end, and then you stop and break it down, and then you could reset it up. Makes sense, right? You do a batch, a batch, a batch. They're set up to be continuous. Um, the distillation columns in a petroleum refinery, they basically just bring in oil, crude oil constantly and are constantly at a, at a more or less consistent rate feeding crude oil into the bottom of the distillation column and they just heat it at a constant level. Um, and they do really clever things like um, when, when, the, um, when things condense, they give off energy. Right, and so they give off heat. They use that that heat from things condensing to heat up the water that then goes on to boil the crude. Um, so they basically find ways to like minimize their loss. They're really really good at that. Um, and the result of those continuous columns, if you basically this one right here that has all of the different um, scaffolding on the outside. Every one of those scaffolding points is basically a different place where it collects. So it's basically set up so that down here you've got your crude that's being heated. And then as it goes up, there's a spot that kind of collects. There's like a, a torus, a donut shaped little collection thing, or half of a donut, I guess, that collects things. And at different heights, it's collecting at different temperatures. And so all those different things right here on the picture are the different collection points that all can um, that are all match up with. Um, so maybe this would be the, the 400 Celsius. This is the 200 Celsius. This is the one, the 100 Celsius. Um, and this is the 50 Celsius. And so basically they just are running this thing constantly and just they just have it all being collecting and then running out of a pipe from each of these collection points. So really, really amazing engineering. Um, and it's, you know, it's 
remember my degrees in chemical engineering, so I had to study these and I see how complicated they are. I still have a few of your friends that work for Chevron um, and still are able to sleep at night. Not sure how, but um, probably on a gigantic pillow of money. <laughs> um, but it's just a really, really interesting application in the way that, that they collect this and the way that it shows up in everything. So your waxes, asphalt, and tars, stuff that never boils. Um, stuff like grease, Vaseline is gonna be what you get here at you know 20, 20 carbons, but that's a liquid at, at a certain temperature. Heating oil and diesel. Heating oil is more used back east where we don't have a lot of this on the West Coast. Um, our furnaces mostly are electric or natural gas out here, but back east there's still lots and lots of places um, where they use oil burning furnaces in the winter rather than natural gas burning furnaces. Um, yeah, they, they're not particular. And that's actually one of the reasons, one of several reasons why the price of gas goes down in the winter. It's not because people are driving less, well, that's part of it. It's actually mostly because they can't slow down the production um, and the, the rate that they're refining crude because they have to make enough heating oil so that people don't freeze to death back east. Right. And so, but they can't just make the heating oil. If they're making the heating oil, they're making everything. And so they're making more gasoline and people are driving less so the price of gas drops. In the summer, they don't need as much heating oil. And so they're building up, they're making all this heating oil that they have to store it and the oil companies don't like to store stuff. Um, and so price of gas goes up because they, they don't ramp up gasoline production the way they do heating oil production in the winter. Um, and kerosene, jet fuel, solvents, um, natural gas, petrochemicals, plastics. It's, they don't actually make the plastics, but that's what they use it for. A lot of times these one to four carbon pieces, they then take that and they use it as a feedstock for other things like making solvents for chemistry research, but also um, for making various plastics. And that all starts in the one to four carbon range. Um, they end up with like, you know, like a certain carbon size that's like excess, you know, when they're, are they able to like um, react that to change the carbon chain? So that's not what they're in the business of. They don't want to do that. Okay. That's a little bit, another good example of something like that is in my, my father-in-law is a realtor and during the, the mortgage meltdown in the 2000s, um, he was, his primary employer was a bank that was just going around foreclosing on people that couldn't pay for their houses. They didn't want him to flip houses. They were just paying him to make sure the tenants were gone, sell it at a basement, bar, bargain basement price, because they're not a real estate company, they're a bank. Oil companies are the same way. They're not a chemistry company, they're an oil refinery. So all they want to do is refine oil and get the products out. Um, they could do that if they had a more holistic approach. Um, and now with the way, with an, way analytics work, if a company like Amazon or Google um, that are, have their fingers in a little bit of everything, um, that's sort of the way that monopolies are going right now, right? They're not dominating one market share. They're getting like 10% of every market as opposed to 90% of one market. Um, if a company like Amazon or Google got into oil refining, they would probably do that. They would have their own in-house like, oh, we have too much of this, let's send it over to the boys over there and, and they can do something with it. And then that's their department. Um, but historically, that's not how it's been done. It's interesting that they have to make all the products at once. I thought they could just target. Yeah, no, that's, they can't. And next time, if you drive to uh, to Berkeley or San Francisco, um, when you drive through Richmond, um, there's all of those, there's a refinery there, but the refinery is way off in the distance, but there's a ton of, of um, what, look like water tanks at different heights. That's where they store all the stuff before it can then be shipped out through the, through the Oakland um, ports. Um, that's, that's where my buddy works for Chevron, who's now, you know, he's in Perth. Um, if you get a job as a chemical engineer working for, for one of the big oil companies, it's like joining the military. You get like stationed different places for a few years and then you move somewhere else when, you're, when your assignment's over. Um, so now he's in Perth. But he was in Richmond for a few years, and um, 
the, like the stories that, that he would tell, like they lose his, when they have to shut it down, I told you it's a continuous process. If they have to shut it down, it costs them something like, something like $10 million an hour to be closed down because, and then they have to spend extra money to ramp it back up, to get everything back up to temperature again. They're designed to be continuous, but that means that they're really bad at stopping and starting, um, which is uh, kind of kind of interesting to think about. Um, Sounds like it's always expensive. Yeah, it's it's always going to be expensive, and you know, and and one of the other things really interesting about this, and I don't remember where I read this, what book this was in. Um, it might have been in a Michael Pollan book, the guy who wrote *Omnivore's Dilemma*. Um, where he talks about, they, they basically figured out how to do this during World War II to try and supply all of the, the fuel that was needed and they're making stuff out of plastics even back then. Um, and then they, but then they realized that they could apply the same logic of make, make, take a crude product and turn it into 10 different things and then ship those 10 different things to 10 different factories that take it and make something else. Um, they figured out that they could apply that same logic to food, which is why the U.S. is so, so heavily dependent on corn and soy. 90% of what we grow is corn and soy because they figured out they could do the same thing with corn and soy, which is why everything has corn in it and everything has soy in it. Because you can make a whole bunch of things from that and they have these highly, highly efficient processing plants that take the raw product and turn it into soybean oil, corn oil, high fructose corn syrup, all that stuff. Um, and it's a direct result of the engineers from World War II realizing we can do the same thing with food that we did with crude. Um, and I don't know how well proven that is, but it certainly tracks with the timeline. And, and what, what we do, the, the, can, the number of parallels between the petroleum industry and the and large crops like corn and soy is really, really um, similar way it's all handled. It's just a flow chart of the same of a uh, petroleum refinery. Um, where's the... <clears throat> Here's the one I was looking for. Basic, oh, here. So your crude oil comes in and all of the steam that is, is generated when your stuff condenses. That's your, um, the grayed out circles is where you've got a heat exchanger that's taking the extra heat from the distillation power and then using it to preheat the crude that comes in to the bottom of the distillation power. Um, so like I said, very, very lucrative, um, very, very complex. And you can see why people get paid what they do to work in petroleum engineering. Um, the, other, the other thing that's really interesting to me is is engineering in general is a field where it's one of those fields where you don't actually like hit your stride and start producing for the company or for um, making money until you hit your mid forties usually because it takes you that long to get the hang of what all of this is and start to see where there might be inefficiencies. Process engineers, the ones who actually design the refineries, um, they get paid tons of money once they hit their 40s and they're just like apprentices until then um as opposed to fields like math and pure research where if you haven't made your mark by the time you're 25 then you're washed up and you're, you're never going to do anything good um which is it's one of those kind of like art or music where if you're not struck by inspiration in your early 20s then you might as well might as well pack it up um engineering is almost the opposite Nobody expects engineers in their 20s to be any good at anything. All right, let's talk a little bit about conformers now. Um, and I, like I mentioned before, so conformers, it's a different conformation, a different shape of the same molecule. So just having things twisted around differently, um, drawn in a different direction, all of that stuff, um, it would just be a different conformer. So there's isomers, which are different molecules with the same formula. Conformer is the same molecule with a different shape. And sometimes it can be very hard to tell the difference between the two. 
Um, so we're, we're going to spend some time with that. And as things get more complicated, um, wedges and dashes we're already pretty familiar with, right? That's our standard way of showing this. Um, this sawhorse projection is basically what you're showing is this bond that's drawn backwards or it's going into the board and out of the board. So you have one carbon pointing out towards you with the with my fingers being the hydrogens. And the other one is pointing into the board away from you, right? So it's taken this shape and rotated at 90 degrees. But if you do that and the people that you're communicating with are used to sawhorse, you don't need to show it with wedges and dashes, um, which is one of the reasons why we um, why we have these sort of standardized notations so that you don't need to be good at drawing in three dimensions, right? Um, if you take this one, sawhorse is not that commonly used. The Newman projection is though, and a Newman projection is just if you continued rotating that so that this carbon was directly in front of the blue carbon. So basically you're looking directly down that carbon-carbon bond. And so you get something like this, right? And so the Newman projection is that, um, is anytime you're gonna draw, you're looking directly down the carbon-carbon bond. And then you just draw what pieces are attached to each of them. Right, and this makes it really obvious to see sometimes um, in three dimensions how these things would be shaped. Because if you look at this, the blue hydrogens are all, the way it's drawn, the blue hydrogens are all aligned so that they're kind of splitting the difference between the red hydrogens, right? That red hydrogens are kind of stuck where they are, the blue, relative to each other. The blue hydrogens are stuck where they are relative to each other. But the blue ones can move relative to the red ones because you can twist along that carbon-carbon bond. So the, another way of drawing this, this same molecule at a different polymer, so, and the way we, we usually draw these, you just draw a circle and then you split the circle into, into thirds. Because if you're looking, if you think something tetrahedral, yeah, these are really 190 degrees apart from each other. But that, that's, when you look at it um, end on, it's going to appear like they're 120 degrees from each other, right? Because that extra 10 degrees of them being closer together comes from bending up towards each other, right? So when they're flat, though, they're 120 degrees. They appear 120 degrees. And then, you put the, the back carbons all the way to the middle, right? So it's just a little bit of really rough perspective. The ones that are in the front, you can see the bonds going all the way to the middle. The ones that are behind, the carbon, think of the circle as being the carbon-carbon bond. The carbon-carbon bond is obscuring those bond, the hydrogen bonds in the back. So you don't draw them going all the way to the middle. That's how you keep it straight, what's attached where. All right, so here's the way it was drawn on the slide. You could conceivably rotate, and it's kind of up to you when pick which one you want to rotate. You, typically, the way we think about this is you're going to hold one of the two carbons still and rotate the other one. But it's all relative to your frame of reference, right? So you can pick whichever one you want to stay still by convention. I usually pick the front carbon and hold it still and move the carbon in the back. But that's personal preference. I don't think that there is really a standard. It's not something where they teach it. Always move the one in the back. Um, you can move the one in the front if it's convenient for whatever reason. Or this is the one we're back and the one we're back. So let me, I'll show you what I mean. Yeah, it was the same. If you take the one in the back and rotate it, so that they were all on top of each other from our point of view, 
that's a different conformer of the same same molecule, right? All we did is we took our C2H6 and twisted 60 degrees. Which one of these would we expect to be lower in energy? I had two different answers. Why? Um, because they, wait, based on the slides before. <laughs> Yeah, that one would be lower in energy because the hydrogen um, pushing against each other. So would that make it lower in energy? It would make it or would make it less stable. It would make it less stable, making it less and making it higher in energy. Higher? Oh yeah, it's negative. Yeah. <laughs> so remember, more stable always means lower in energy. So you two are gonna say the same thing, I'm assuming, Rob, because you pointed to this one. But that's just the way I phrased the question, right? right? So this one's more stable, which we, by convention we would say is lower in energy. To get from this one to this one, we have to put energy in. So we'd say that this is higher energy. Yeah, and it's, it's because those electron, this arranges those electron clouds. We draw the bonds as being sticks, right? But they're really clouds. They're really orbitals. And this, Confirmation is what allows them to be further apart from each other. And so this is what we call staggering. And this is what we call eclipsed. Which those terms always made sense to me from a just from an English language standpoint. Um, but I also spent a lot of time reading, reading when I was in high school. And um, so just to make it really clear, staggered meaning one then the other. They're not on top of each other. Um, just like you might stagger your, if you're working two jobs, you have to stagger your shifts between the two jobs. So you're not supposed to be in two places at once, right? Eclipse means that one's on top of the other. One's obscuring one behind it, just like a solar eclipse, right? Oh, that's right. Huh? It's and it's not complete for us, but there's a but it's pretty close, isn't it? It's like eighty percent when it's like fully on. Nice, that was fun. Um, the last the last complete one that they had in. I think it was a couple summers ago now in, in Oregon. Um, Bruce has some really good pictures because he was at a baseball game in Oregon that was in the path of totality. And so they stopped the baseball game so that and everybody got out their solar glasses and all the players are like laying out on the field watching. And then they, for, you know, half an hour or something like that. And then they resumed the game. Perfect day for Bruce. Yeah, right. <laughs> How could it get any better? He was trying to put it on the, like super early on Saturday. Oh, you go see it. Yeah, uh, cool, because that's where it's totality. All right. Let's see. Let's see. All right, so a lot of times, so I'm going to, I'll tell you right now that one of your quiz questions is going to be based, is drawing the Newman projection based on a figure like this. You have to say, you can't just say draw the Newman projection of this molecule because it depends on where you put the observer, right? Which carbon carbon bond are you looking down in which direction? Um, so a lot of times we'll show it like this, especially while you're getting used to this. But it's basically here's a molecule drawn with the regular dots and dashes and, and skeletal structure. And here's the observer. What does the Newman projection look like? So let's do a practice. If we're, this is our molecule. So it's two, four, di, or two, three dibromo butane. What does that conformer look like as a Newman projection? So it's going to look just like one I just drew, except instead of having six hydrogens, there's going to be a methyl group and a bromine on the front carbon, and a methyl group and a, and a bromine on the back carbon. So it's not always a triple. It's always three. It's always going to be three if it's tetrahedral carbon, but it's not always three hydrogens. This one in particular, look at what's attached. 
that that carbon, there's a bromine attached. There's a, a methyl group, a CH3 attached. It's not methyl in terms of naming, but it's a methyl group in terms of it's a CH3. And then it's got a hydrogen that's drawn behind the bromine, right? So try drawing those, a Newman projection and switching out what's attached to those three fronts and three rear bonds. In this case, um, no, you can do it as a condensed structure, just write CH3. Just because we care about this carbon carbon bonds, not those carbon hydrogen bonds, since we're going to be otherwise we can draw on the Newman projection for this bond right here instead of this middle one. So the way I would approach drawing this one, I would try to keep as much of the molecule in the same position as possible. And so the way I would look at this, I'd say, okay, you can either like think about it as physically, I'm going to put my eye up here, and what would I be seeing based on what's into the board and out of the board? Or you can think about it as, okay, I'm the observer, so I'm going to take this and I'm going to just twist it. It's the same thing. It's and we're going to get a lot of practice in in OCHEM with visualizing these three 2D representations of 3D molecules, um, but it's tricky at first. So if I'm standing right here where that eyeball is, I'm looking down that line, there's gonna be one bond that's gonna be straight down from where I'm looking, right? There's gonna be one bond that's up into the right, one bond that's up into the left. And we already talked a little bit, but just to reiterate, so on that carbon, one of the three things that's attached to the CH3 group, right here, one of them is a bromine, and it can be helpful to write things out a little bit too, um, especially if it's given to you as the skeletal structure. So you can say, okay, I've got bromine sticking out of the board to, towards me. I've got hydrogen into the board away from me. And I've got a methyl group that's in the plane of the board down to the left. Shift your frame of reference. That methyl group that was in the plane of the board down. Well, now my eye is in the plane of the board. So the methyl group that is drawn down into the left is when we draw it down from where we're viewing, right? And if the bromine is sticking out of the board towards us, when we're looking at it from up here, and we shift our frame of reference so that we're in the plane of the board, now it's up into the right. And the hydrogen that was into the board, when I rotate, is now up into the left. Again, it takes a little bit of practice to be able to, to do this quickly or reliably without you know, making funny hand motions or picking up your paper and looking at your paper sideways. You're allowed to do that on the test. Um, whatever is gonna help you be able to visualize these things. I do a lot of stuff with my fingers, obviously. I see I'm gonna set it up. Okay, here's my three things that are attached. I've got my thumb is the bromine. My pointer is the hydrogen, and my middle finger is the methyl group. And I would hold it in one place. 
and physically move. My thumb is still growing. This is still the hydrogen. My middle finger is still methyl groups. Right? And so you can see why having molecular model kits can be really helpful too, right? Um, because you can build that structure and turn it physically. But you're not always going to have those with you. And so there's value in being able to do it mentally. It just takes a lot of practice for a while. All right, and I'm going to do the back carbon with, in, I guess I'll do the back carbon in red. So the back carbon has the same three things attached, but pointed in different directions, right? The back carbon has a CH3 and has a hydrogen and a bromine. But for that one, now, yeah, now methyl groups my pointer finger, bromine's my middle finger, and hydrogen's my thumb. If I twist it all the way around, you wind up with this CH3. Now, uh, hydrogen's still in the plane of the board, which so when we rotate, that means the hydrogen's down to the left. In our bromine, down into the right. How'd that go? Easy enough when I'm up here doing my contortionist routine. I was trying to consider the electronegativity of bromine and putting them on either side. So I didn't say draw the most stable conformer, I said draw that conformer. Oh. Right? So, but that's, that's where we're going. So, which of these? We have three different things attached to each carbon, right? In general, it's less about the electronegativity, although that does play a role eventually, and more just about physical size. So out of these, out of a methyl group versus a bromine versus a hydrogen, which one's the biggest? Bromine, right? This goes back to our atomic trends all the way back when we first looked at the periodic table. We looked at you know, oh, when you go down on the periodic table, things get bigger. And when you go from left to right, things get smaller. The biggest variable, though, was how many electron um, energy levels were there, right? When you got to n equals four, it was so much bigger than n equals three. Bromine's got an n equals four electrons. Carbon only has n equals two. So even though there are more atoms, bromine is actually physically larger in this case. It's going to be a sliding scale. If this was a whole, if this was a whole cycle pencil group, then all of a sudden that's going to be bigger than the bromine. It's going to be, and you kind of develop a little bit of experience with that, and you'll get better at it. Um, but for now, what we're looking at is mostly what's got the most, the highest energy level, because that's going to be the biggest object. So the bromines are the two biggest things, then the carbons, then the hydrogen by itself, right? So the most stable conformation would be if we could put the two bromines opposite from each other. And it's easy enough to do if we have it drawn as this Newman projection. Because all we're going to do is take it, as, well, we wouldn't really want to rotate it. So let's, again, let's try and keep the, the black ones still and we'll rotate the red ones. We could rotate the bromine this way and then the methyl group comes over here and the hydrogen comes over here, that didn't really gain us anything, right? If we want the bromines as far apart as possible, we're gonna rotate the red substituents clockwise. I always have to think about that one. Right tight, clockwise. Anybody know what they used to say for counterclockwise before they had clocks? Mittershins. <laughs> It's, it used to be, it was, um, if you were rotating things with witter shins or spinning witter shins, it was spinning against the rotation of the earth. And it was seen as very, um, it was seen as evil. It was like a sign of witchcraft. The Druids in, in England used to do um, you know, rituals where they would spin witter shins around the can of fire and things like that. Or at least that's what the, the Christians claimed before they burned them all. Um, <laughs> So clockwise, I'm still, I'm still throw bitter shins in there every once in a while just for fun. Um, 